Hey, this is Andy. And Randy. And we're here on AT Corner. Being an athletic trainer comes with ups and downs, and we're here to showcase it all. Join us as we share our world in sports medicine. Welcome back to another episode of AT Corner. Our first story episode of National Athletic Training Month is talking about a very unique thing amongst athletic trainers. What do you mean by unique? We are talking about the journey of how you became an athletic trainer, and that is very unique. My my initial reaction is no, <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like a lot of athletic trainers feel like they have very similar journeys, uh-huh. like, oh, I found out I was injured. I was an injured athlete, and then... I was taken care of by an AT. Like, I feel like that's a lot of what athletic trainers tend to tend to say. Um, but again, that's my first initial reaction <laughs> because we actually got a lot very, very broad, differing answers from that. Yeah. Um, and I'm just like really excited about this. I think the general theme tends to be the same where Mm -hmm. most Mm -hmm. people are like, oh, I was an athlete, I got injured. But I feel like within that, like the finer details are so unique to everyone and just how um, even like some of the people we talk about on their interview, it's like sometimes just the stars just align and oh, you found athletic training. The details of each journey in athletic training, I think, are the are the really, really cool yes. parts. And some of these stories even talk about going full circle. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So in this episode, we are going to talk about some different journeys in athletic training, how people got here. Um, we do have an internship story. We actually don't have any formal bachelor stories. Like, I think people submitted some bachelor stories, but they didn't like talk specifically about okay. like that. There's more people talking about like their MSAT program. Okay. Um, well, that makes me feel old. <laughs> um, yeah, just general like how people found out about athletic training. I guess. Uh, I guess I'll I'll have to supplement for the uh, the the bachelor group. Yes, you will. <laughs> um, how people have moved through their career through different settings. Um, how people have utilized mentors. Okay. And then um, two other things. So any changes that people would make in their journey. And then lastly, just some advice. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. So I think it's a very like well-rounded episode. We're going to go. Um, I know your journey in athletic training yes. is a lot different than my journey in athletic <laughs> training. Yes. Which I think is also funny because I feel like everyone just thinks we went to the same school and did like the same. Everyone does think things. we went to the same school, which is yeah. funny. Nope. But I do have to say, I'm really stoked for this episode because I think it really highlights um, celebrating ATs during, you know, National Athletic Training Month. And what better way than to just kind of celebrate that journey Mm -hmm. that each one of us has made to finding the career that we love. Well, why don't we kick it off with a gem from Jen? Uh, Of course. Yes. Well, my journey in athletic training goes along with the story about lasting relationships. So gather around the Snapchat, children, and listen to my tale. If you haven't watched Eliza Schlesinger, you really need to. So it's the first week of volleyball training camp in 1991. Shut up. Shut up now. (laughs) I'm a train wreck of an athlete. Always have been. I walk into the ATR and meet our new student AT and ask her to tape my ankles. We start talking, find out we're both originally from the Northeast. We were at a college in Virginia and started talking to each other back and forth in an accent from that part of the country. We instantly hit it off. Fast forward to 1996. She's working as an AT in South Carolina, and I'm in a horrible dead-end job working at a bank. I had a rough end to my academic college career and decided 10 weeks before graduation that the career that I had planned on just wasn't what I wanted. Mm. That's tough. Mm -hmm. So graduation happened, and I had no plans. I was thinking and thinking and thinking. So I called her from work one day, because you had to pay for long-distance phone calls in those days, kiddos. Oh my gosh. And we were talking again about what my life should be. I asked her, what do you think about me becoming an AT? I feel like that's like the light bulb, like, bing! Yes. (laughs) She said, 
Well, thank God you finally said it because I was sitting here just waiting for you to realize it. Isn't that funny? I feel like sometimes we're the last ones. Like everyone around us is like, come on, clue in, clue in, clue in. <laughs> well, that's all. That's the best part about having, you know, those close friends or that support system. Sometimes they know you maybe a little bit better uh, than you know yourself. And an outside perspective. Absolutely. Jen's response was, so how do I do this? Ended up figuring out a plan to take the internship route to be able to sit for the BOC exam. This included a phone call where I spoke with Ken Knight without knowing who Ken Knight was an entire year with her as my boss while completing my internship hours. That's crazy. Dude, Ken Knight? <laughs> all the mo- all the modality nerds out there, they know. <laughs> we know we know who Ken Knight is. We've been through ups and downs. I was maid of honor at our wedding and we're still besties today. We live half a country apart, but we keep in touch regularly, and we'll be seeing each other in March for my spring break. Thanks to VCU Volleyball for bringing us together, and this wonderful profession for helping keep our friendship going for over 30 years. Aww. That's nice. (laughs) I thought that was a really good one to start with. That's a good one to start with. Especially like internship route, you know, that's like how a lot of ATs um, were doing um, their certifications. And so I think that's the only internship route one we got. Oh, okay. Interesting. I mean, actually, I didn't put in a lot of the um, the question box. A lot of people um, responded on how they found out about athletic training. But um, as far as like story stories. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think we got any more internship route ones. Oh, okay. Interesting. Which I feel like internship route kids like love to share their stories it's oh, yes. so different from what it is now oh 100 percent. i mean it's gonna be the same thing you know later on in my career when i tell students that i was the bachelor's route you want to tell your story uh yeah i mean i know i've said it before um you know i found at initially when i started um college cal state fullerton baby go titans <laughs> Um, I was actually a geology major, and my thinking at the time was, you know, I was really interested in uh, in sports, and I wanted to coach baseball. And, you know, a lot of coaches tend to be also teachers, you know, initially. So mm-hmm. at that time, the environmental sciences were were very interesting to me. So I was like, oh, like, perfect, I'll, I'll do this. Um, I would say that first semester and then going into the second semester, the classes just it wasn't really what I was into. I was just like, nah, I don't know. You retained a lot of that though. Oh, I appreciate it. A lot of that information. I appreciate it. I can tell every time we go on a hike, he's like, Oh, so this rock and (laughs) this cloud and this, um, sedimentary system. And (laughs) I have my moments. (laughs) Um, and again, this is why I just feel like the journey into athletic training is so unique. When you look at the details, um, I literally found athletic training. I was looking at our, you know, the website, uh, Fullerton's website of, you know, diff- different, different, uh, programs that they offered. And I found athletic training and I started reading up on what it is. And I said, Oh my gosh, this is like really cool. And, you know, for the athletic training program, they required X amount of volunteer hours. So, um, I reached out everywhere I could. And I, you know, luckily Cal Poly Pomona, um, Big hats off to our guy, Rum. Big shout out. Which, oh, sorry. Burp, 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 burp. You can do your horn. There we go. <laughs> um, he was on our episode for interviews. Yes. You know, he he believed in me, gave me a chance, and I still remember my first day. Uh, my task was to make heel and lace pads. That's all. That's what I did. It's and, a big task. Yeah. And um, from that day on, just seeing what, you know, they did as you know, for the athletes and like just what athletic trainers do. I fell in love with it. And ever since then, you know, it's almost impossible to get me out of the athletic training room. I feel like now easier than before. <laughs> yes. Back then, <laughs> back then I did not leave. They would tell me, Hey, like Randy, you can go home. Like, and you're like why? we're done for the day. <laughs> like, Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, you know, from that moment I, you know, fell in love with it and, you know, Got my hours, um, finally got into the athletic training program at Cal State Fullerton. And, you know, I 
the time that I got in was perfect. You know, my cohort, you know, they're still family to me. Um, literally in my phone, they're either ATEP brother or ATEP sister because um, they're literally family to me. And, you know, that's, it, it uh, couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't change it. I wouldn't change that journey at all. You know, um, we don't even call them ATEPs anymore, right? No, no. So, Again, this really kind of, I was I was at a very interesting time in the world of <laughs> athletic training. I, apparently I was in the big transition phase mm-hmm. because right when I got into the athletic training program, that was right when we it was transitioned from ATEP to just athletic training program. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense, right? Like athletic training education program like like in medical school, right? It's not the medical education program, right? It is an education program. So so, so the name change makes sense, but back then it was ATEP. Ours used to be in the school of education, and then mine changed over to kinesiology. Which uh, a lot of these programs being housed in education, you know, is a very kind of old, not I don't want to say old school, but I mean, that's how one kinesiology was kind of founded is more of a teaching thing and more like mm-hmm, PE. Mm-hmm. So that's why a lot of these older universities have it in the department of education, which yeah. is a fun fact. Mine changed right before I started, I believe. Uh, yes, I think you're right. Mm-hmm. So we actually, the next two are just like super heartwarming. Okay. They're both from athletic trainers who got into the profession because their moms were ATs. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that cool? That's cool. That's a uh, that's a future that our future kids could be looking down. <laughs> you know what? They might yeah. be ATs. Yeah. And then I'm I mean, gonna tell them I'm sorry. I wonder how much the profession is gonna change by then. Oh, it's gonna be so different. Okay, maybe not so different, but I bet they're. It's definitely gonna be different. A hundred percent. And I hope so. I hope you know right. we continue to progress as a profession. Maybe we'll have a practice act in California. I think by then. I think we will. (laughs) So this first one's by Erica C. She said, my mom was an athletic trainer. She took us to work all the time, and I really liked what she did. I did a lot of different settings. My mom worked for a little at DePaul University, the high school setting, and is now in the billing department for Athletico. She needed regular hours to keep up with me and my three sisters. I work in the Catholic high school setting. She and I really bond over it. My dad also completely understands me too when I'm ta- when I'm talking AT philosophy, <laughs> LOL. My dad hung out in the athletic training room at DePaul and watched my mom as well. Nice. That's cool. I was like, it's a family affair. It is. It's just like it's different because like we're both ATs. Mm-hmm. So like thinking about like like someone else in a relationship not being an AT, like <laughs> what do you think? Like what, what goes through your head? I know. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know, like, because, like, I, like, I go hang out with you at work sometimes and vice versa, but, right, like, we right. kind of know what we're looking at and, like, right. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know what that life is like. Yeah. I, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This next one's by Callie H. My mama is the best AT I know. We are not in the same setting. She very strongly dislikes high school kids. She started in the high school setting well over 30 years ago, then moved to collegiate. She has since transitioned over to being a full-time professor at a private college at the NAIA level, and I'm at a private high school. We do get to work together in the summer at a cheer company we both work for, which is fun. That's cool. Isn't it? That's kind of cool, like when you get to work together. Mm -hmm. I wonder how hard that is for the parent, though. What do you mean? I don't know. I feel like it'd be kind of weird working with my parents <laughs> for the kid or for the parent i think it'd be weird for the kid to work with the parent like i feel i don't know i feel like your mom listens to this and i think she would agree that that'd be <laughs> kind of weird like as a parent like i feel like you'd want to do more for your kids right like, right like i feel like like not on that peer level yeah you know i don't know like i feel like maybe you'd be like stepping in a little bit more, not like in a mean way, but mm-hmm. like more mm-hmm. of in a supportive kind of like, mm-hmm. like kind of being there kind of way, which I feel like might be a little weird when it's like a coworker situation. Right. It's like I can tell you different things versus yeah. like just a random coworker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so I feel like that might make I feel like would be awkward, but that's really cool. I think that's something unique that one not a lot of ATs would get to experience. No, definitely not. I mean, also every person's relationship with their parents yes. is different anyway. Absolutely. So. I mean, it's kind of like uh, for all the baseball fans out there, Ken Griffey Jr. playing with his dad, <laughs> Ken Griffey Sr. I mean, that's kind of cool. Have we really, really worked together? Like, not no. not since we were certified, huh? Not since we were both certified. Yeah. So I met Randy a week after he got certified. That's right. <laughs> yep. I never knew you as a... As a student. We we passed by each other. We, uh, we, did, we, we were we at the same talk. We competed in Quiz Bowl against each other. Yes, we did. But we didn't know. And nope. um, um, he came to my school for when Scott Saylor came to talk. Per- then President Scott Saylor. Mm-hmm. That was a great talk. We have a giant group photo that no one can find. There are pictures. Okay. There are pictures that we took together, but literally we can't find them. No. Before we met. Yep. Before before 2017, if you guys have any photos the before, of the before times, the before times of me and Randy or of Quiz Bowl at Fuada or Fuada in general. Yeah. I can't find any. Well, I mean, maybe it's a good thing because <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty nerdy now, but man, looking back at some of those pictures, I'm like baby glow nerd. Glow up. <laughs> yes, I, I did get new <laughs> new glasses. So a lot, oh, yeah. a lot of growth. Yep. Mm hmm. I couldn't get these glasses until I was 30. I said that. Man, I, you know what? I don't know if we will work together unless it's like some event. Yeah. I'd say so. Or unless you travel and we play opposite sidelines. Yeah. Will but you, then it's will like... Will come travel, work my basketball game? Is my my team there? Well, yeah. Yeah. Is that technically... But, but, but I don't know if... Like... If it's not postseason, I'm not sure. Just because of how our work schedule is. Really? Yeah. Oh, but you do like a lot of indoor. Yeah. Hmm. All indoor, baby. Elements elements aren't a thing for me right now. I love See, it. See, in the winter, I only have basketball, so. Yeah. I mean, I would like to. That'd be cool, but I don't want to mess up my work schedule. Whatever. Fine. Don't travel but then for I don't, your wife. I don't, I, that's not what that <laughs> is. Okay, so... um. Sarah Y said she stumbled upon athletic training through a teammate. Ooh, that's cool. She said, I had never heard of athletic training until I went to college. One of my rugby teammates was an AT major, and that piqued my interest. I did a little research and felt that this was the right path for me. We did not have an AT for rugby as it was a club sport and not varsity. I was pre-med forensics major before I switched. I originally wanted to be a forensic pathologist and do autopsies like on CSI. (laughs) But once I found out about AT, I changed paths and didn't look back. What's really funny is we had a cadaver anatomy available my junior year of athletic training, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. So maybe I wasn't cut out to do my original (laughs) idea, and I came across athletic training to get set in my real path of profession. that's true. Man, I wish I had cadaver anatomy, though. I know, me too. That'd be awesome. We should should take one. If anyone has a great cadaver anatomy course, that'd be great. Shoot it our way. (laughs) Yeah, Um, Yeah, locally it would be great. (laughs) So I also didn't know what athletic training was until I went to college. Yeah, me too. Because we didn't have one at our high school. I think that we had a sports med class, which is so weird to me um, because I'm not sure who taught it. Yeah. Oh, unless unless they had like a random coach teach it. Oh, interesting. But yeah. um, we definitely didn't have an athletic trainer. We didn't have contract athletic trainers. Did you have ROP at your class at your school? I don't know about that specific one because oh, okay. it was only one year that they offered it. And oh, I think okay. it was like I was a freshman and so I couldn't even take it. But yeah. I remember like distinctly, I remember there being a paper up on the door that said sports med. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, Looking back, I did see our high school AT mm-hmm. um, when I was when I was doing the scorebook for baseball. That's right. Just when you thought it couldn't get any nerdier <laughs> in high school, I did the scorebook my senior year. That's cool. That was great. It was pretty cool. But yeah, no, looking back, I did see the AT out there. But at the time, I didn't know what that was. Right. And literally like that next year, I found out what the athletic training was. I was like, this is dope. I didn't even grow up watching sports, so I had no no um, clue at all. Well, traditional sports. I mean, 
You did some performing arts, some gymnastics. Yes. Um, so actually, I was going to go to school for dance. Yes. Um, to be a dance major, to open a dance studio. Yes. And do concert dance. Which, but what was one of the schools in consideration? Chapman. And didn't you have Cal State Fullerton on that list? Like as a low backup. Hey, doesn't matter. Go Titans. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. I put all my eggs in one basket and yes. said Chapman all the way. <laughs> So anyway, I went to Chapman and um, I got awarded work study. So literally right before school started in mm-hmm. August, I applied to be a student athletic assistant, which was one of the only <laughs> jobs available at the time. And I was like, oh, this sounds cool. And um, I got a call the next day while I was at the mall. So random at the mall. Um, and it was from our football coach. Our football coach called. Uh-huh. And he was like, hey, we'd like to interview you. And I was like, I don't know how to interview. I don't know what that. Okay. And so then I went in, didn't even know what to wear. I ended up dressing like professional, um, which I'm surprised I even had those clothes. And then um, it was literally like there was like one question, I think. It was like, what? um, Oh, what question did he ask? He was like. Uh, what major are you and something about like either why you wanted this or like if you've done any sports or anything and i was like yeah i'm a dancer (laughs) Ah, (laughs) and i'm like telling the football coach this like so confident like and um you do exude confidence though i do not yes you do in those situations you do no not back then (laughs) Ah. so then anyway um I don't know how I just got the job, but then he um, walked us downstairs to the basement athletic training room where um, the head athletic trainer usually is, um, but she wasn't there. So I didn't get to meet her. And I was like, well, I don't even know what that is anyway. <laughs> and then she ended up being my boss. Yes. Shout out, Pam. Burr, 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 burr. Yeah. And then um, I just started working with under her. And I remember the first time that she had run out, someone had um, got a turf burn because we had turf. Yep. And she had like tended to him and fixed him right up. And then he went back out. And then I was like so jealous that I never had anyone to tend to my injuries. Yeah. And so then I had like this like bright eyed bushy tail. I was like, oh, this I'm definitely going to take this. I'm going to go into performing arts and bring this to performing arts and I remember dancers that. and dance studios and gymnasts. And that's. No one has done that yet, right? Well, th- and that was when we first met. That was the first thing you told me, what you were thinking about. Yeah, I was like really set on this yeah. idea, like really set. And then I, d- I mean, I did my program and then I did performing arts. I still do performing arts, but I mean, football is what got me into athletic training. So football is what's going to keep me there. You can have football. <laughs> you can definitely have okay this next one is our the one that we were talking about in the beginning where it's through just getting injured oh, okay so like first hand experience experience with an athletic trainer this one's by shannon d there were only about 10 entry-level master's programs when i applied and yes i do remember that time i liked seton hall the best because of their clinical options with pro sports Go Hall. I knew I wanted to work in medicine, but I didn't know what field. I shadowed a PT and I liked it, but I didn't love it. I broke my scaphoid in high school playing basketball and had my PCP look at it slash x-ray it, and it was missed. I played the rest of high school with it broken and my first season of collegiate field hockey. I told our head AT and he brought me to see the ortho because he knew it was fractured. Confirmed with x-rays in ulnar deviation, which they didn't do the first time. I had to have surgery and rehabbed with my college ATs and learned about the profession. I did a work study with them and was hooked. Hey, I know that hooked feeling. (laughs) My head AT counseled me through the entry-level master programs, so I didn't have to transfer. Shout out to Dave Tomkowski at Elmira College. Man, there's a lot of shout outs today. I know there's gonna be more. <laughs> All right. Which I mean, when you look back on your journey, it's important to 
you know, shout out those people that have made such a big impact. Mm-hmm. And got you started. Mm-hmm. Dude, that's crazy. Fractured scaphoid. Yeah, I didn't, yeah. It's also funny to me because I definitely didn't see myself going in any sort of healthcare or any sort of like, I'm not a, I'm not a natural giver, so going into a giving profession is like something that was not in my wheelhouse. Yeah. So that's kind of crazy to me. <laughs> and even like you and I are so different. And I think that that's, it's just really cool seeing like the differences between each person and like each clinician and how they, how they run their practice and yes. Yeah. And how they got here. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, I think it is pretty cool to see how each clinician, you know, how they shape their philosophy and like what their clinics like and, you know, the program that, you know, their student athletes get used to or, you know, patients get used to and the system. It's really cool to see. Mm -hmm. I had a, so my program was actually a five year undergrad and master's program together. And so, um, I actually didn't go through the process of having to apply for different MSATs because essentially my senior year was the first year of my grad program. Yeah. And so unless I didn't complete my grad program or my undergrad program in three years, then I like I was on that applied track already. Yeah. So I didn't have to even decide. Like, I'm really glad that Chapman worked out for me and it was like yeah. what I needed, but I didn't even have to worry about like, oh, what does this program offer which versus like this program? Yeah, no, same. I, you know, I couldn't see myself anywhere but, you know, Fullerton's program and that's what I wanted. And, you know, yeah, there was, I, there were some backups that at a certain time I was like, man, I might have to consider, but no, I put, again, put all those eggs in one basket. That's where I wanted to be. That was my dream. And yeah. So moral of the story, put your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd say so. Um so this next one kind of like goes in that theme about like different programs and just finding your spot. So this one's by Kate B. I have a un- pretty unique experience. Put your seatbelts on. To preface, I transferred schools one semester into my freshman year as I was horribly homesick. In undergrad, I decided to major in exercise science as I wasn't sure that the athletic training or that athletic training was what I wanted to do. Going into my junior year, I applied for a job to be an athletic training room assistant on campus. My point of view was that this job would help me decide if AT was what I really wanted to do. Lo and behold, I realized I loved it. But at this point, I was graduating a semester early and did not find it worth it to transfer to another undergrad program. My plan was to graduate in December, take prereqs in the spring, start an MAT program that summer. I was accepted into program number one on the condition that I passed my pre- prereq courses. Yeah, that that uh, uh, that condition can get you sometimes. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Except for my, in my case, it was general education courses. So mm. those ones will mm. get you. Unfortunately, one of the classes was way too much, and I had to defer my enrollment another year. Next semester comes, I move my life six hours away. I'm there for probably two to three weeks of classes, and I was extremely depressed to the point that I thought of checking myself into a hospital. Man. I went home with my program support, finished classes from there, and unfortunately moved out of my apartment back home and left the program. While going back to my mentors for guidance, I learned of a remote MAT program. This is program number two. Okay. I thought although I needed to be across the country for two months, it would be okay since I could be at home during the school year. I drove 27 hours across three days to only be at the school for four days, three days of classes, before I decided to drop out. I was so torn as I knew athletic training was what I wanted, but there wasn't a healthy way for me to get there. So I decided for the next year to do clinical massage therapy program through the SOMA Institute. Instead of hot stone and aromatherapy massage, I was learning about conditions I would be treating as an athletic trainer. And to my luck, during this time, a master's program was being offered only an hour away from home. Nice. Preface that there were none offered in my state before this point. I jumped on the application and quickly got accepted and enrolled. I have to give a huge thank you to some of the mentors as they were willing to write me letters of recommendation after all this time (laughs) we talked through it. Started my MIT program summer of 2018, took my BOC three times, and then got certified during COVID spring 2020 semester. Worked at a job I hated for five months and now 
absolutely love the college where I'm at. I'm a third party contracted. Oh, that's awesome. Here's what I always think about. Um, but no, it all happened for a reason. I could have gotten certified sooner. I could have gotten started sooner instead of almost at 30. But if I did, I may have not met the people I had, developed the relationships that I now cherish, or have found a setting slash company that appreciates me and takes care of me. So as much as earlier would have been nice, I know everything happened the way it did for me to be where I am today. Oh, 100%. 100%. You know what? That is something that I feel like is a motto. Like, that's that's a good motto. Like what and i was thinking about this when we put up the poll of like would you change anything yeah in your past and if you change things like they those are the things that make you yeah that's true like if i started my program sooner i wouldn't have been in the cohort that i that i was in and mm-hmm. that you know that's that's my family right so yeah no i i definitely feel that and all that stuff does shape you as the person and clinician you become. So all very important. Even even though there are sometimes those not so fun times that you're like, man, I wish we could have done that different. But it is also <laughs> important because, again, it the good and the bad shape you. Oh, definitely. The bad definitely shapes you. You, you learn lessons really quick in those situations. Mm-hmm. And it, I, <laughs> I always say like it's so hard to see in the moment, but... It's all temporary yeah, it is. and it's going to be necessary for whatever's next. Absolutely. That's going to fall in place. Even clinically, right? The mistakes you make clinically, yeah, they blow. And you're like, man, don't want to do that ever again. And that's how you learn. Those are the quickest. Failure is the, the, <laughs> the biggest teacher. You know, I was talking to my baseball coach because, dude, this baseball team, not just this baseball team, but like the past two years of my baseball team, has been uh, <laughs> well you have gotten some interesting cases okay like like fractures that don't appear like fractures ucl tears that don't appear like ucl tears like absolutely nothing is textbook <laughs> and just weird things that i'm like i don't even i've never even heard of that before How, like can you tell your athletes when they get hurt to grab a textbook and Please explain it yes, that way. Yes, please read Get it. Get this yeah, way. Yes. So the other day, not the other day, um, with baseball, I had a UCL tear that had, um, he was only pitching for one inning and he didn't feel a pop. He didn't feel pain during the game. He just felt pain after, like on the way home. Which it sounds like he finished his outing. He finished his outing. That's, that's the wild part to this story. He comes to me um like the next week and or like like i think it was like a saturday game he came to me on monday and he's like hey like i was talking to my coach about my elbow like it's just been hurting and you know i was wondering if you just take a look at it and he was i could not get valgus to open up like he was stable like i could not get any instability but he was tender right on the ucl and and milking massage was yeah was positive so i was like you know what this literally like the mechanism makes no sense and the (laughs) like how you're presenting like kind of doesn't really make too much sense yeah so i'm just gonna call it a ucl tear because this team is really weird with their injuries you've now expected weirdness to the injury exactly (laughs) and it was correct so i was like okay so i was talking to my baseball coach and he's like Dude, we just have like the weirdest. And I was like, you know what? Your team makes me feel like a bad athletic trainer. <laughs> and he said, my team makes me feel like a bad coach. <laughs> oh, well, it's just. Well, I said, we all I'm share glad the we're on the same page. I wonder if the team makes the guys feel like bad <laughs> baseball players. You should ask. No, they <laughs> do not need that. They do not need that. It's a great team. I love that team. Hey, it's only up from here for them. <laughs> um. Yeah, but it's just kind of, oh, those moments are going to shape you. Every single yep. time I get a misdiagnosis with that freaking team, I just go, you know what? It's going to be okay. It's baseball. Baseball. It's only baseball. <laughs> um. So this story is also heartwarming. Oh, I love heartwarming. You want to read it? This one's by Melissa R. 
I'm so blessed to have had my mentors, who are now my colleagues as well. It's as if I've come full circle now. To have started my journey here at GCC all the way to working here after completing my program means so much to me. So I started at my institution many moons ago, the fall of 2004, thinking I was going to major in aerospace engineering. That is very different. That Yes, that's very different. After a few semesters, I realized it was not what I wanted and took a break from school. The one thing I never took a break from was being a cheerleading coach. So I returned to school with the idea of maybe becoming a collegiate cheer coach. I took Intro to Kinesiology, which is where I first heard of athletic training. Our class professor, who is actually one of our coaches, always said how important internships were, especially at the next level. I approached her about my interest in AT, and she introduced me to two certified athletic trainers for the college, Jose Gomez and Claudia Orejuela. I signed on to be a student intern with them and stayed with them even as I transferred to complete my Bachelor's of Science at Cal, at Cal State LA. They wrote my letters of recommendation for my MSAT applications, and they were the first call I made when I found out I was accepted at CBU. I stayed in contact with them as much as I could while in the program, and when I graduated in May 2021. It was almost perfect because in early August 2021, they called to ask me if I'd be willing to work the fall semester there alongside them, primarily with football. I was told it would only be for the fall season, but here I am now, in the middle of my second year working here, alongside two of the best mentors slash colleagues that I am so fortunate to have had. They are the ones who helped me from the very beginning and helped mold my foundation. They have witnessed me go from student intern to graduate student to wife and mom and now colleague. Started my journey at GCC only to come back home to GCC. I am very, I am a very lucky ATC. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's true. I feel that. Yeah. I really like how she's like, I started here and then, you know, people do that. Yeah, that's true. And it is a really unique and rewarding experience. Mm-hmm. To be able to go back to the program that gave you your start. And even if the maybe some of the same people may not be there, you're at least giving back to that program what they gave you. Right. And I feel like you can change like you can change so much from student to certified, even when you're certified, yes. like early certified to like a few years later and Absolutely. There's just a lot a lot that you can like change along the way. Um, I do want to shout out for um, letters of rec and I know I don't know who's listening to this um, students like <laughs> preceptors mentors whatever um, you guys if you get a letter of rec from someone please do a Melissa did and stay in contact yes don't get a letter of rec and then like run for the hills because <laughs> I've I've written a couple of letters of rec and then ghosted yeah and I'm like I can't, it makes me want to take that letter of rec back. Yeah. Don't do that. Like, this is your future. Athletic training is a very small world. Yes. A lot of people know each other. So don't burn don't your bridges be that early. Guy. Don't be that guy. <laughs> so, anyway, on a lighter note, we have this next one's about um, different settings and kind of like how this person transitioned through their career nice. so far, which I've definitely hit lots of settings <laughs> you have you have been very well versed in settings mm, i think i'm here to stay in the community college i think so too we'll see <laughs> <laughs> um so maggie b said i've worked as an athletic trainer at a high school college university setting and in performing arts hey that sounds like me. Uh, yes um actually I'll... literally you <laughs> yeah <laughs> the only thing missing is youth sports for me i think yeah i did youth High school, yeah, you did. college, university, youth football, baby. Arts. Is that all I've done? Yes, yes. Okay, Maggie, we're on the same page. <laughs> all were different, but have helped shape me into the athletic trainer I am today. I started out at a university that was D three, and I worked ten months and had the summer off. 
I knew I had wanted to work and help the athletes still during that time, so I started looking for summer-only opportunities, and that's how I found the drum corps. Nice. Last year, I was unable to be on tour with the group because of COVID and stipulations still, so I did everything virtually. I'm not returning to the Corps this year, and that is only because of the new leads with the Corps. I have stayed in the college setting since I graduated from undergrad. Last year, a local high school in Virginia where I was working at Radford did not have an athletic trainer. Our fellows at Radford covered some of the games at the school and asked myself and my boss to come help cover a football game one night. And from there, I got to talking with the school and the company that did their outreach, and we reached an agreement. From October to June, I covered out at the high school what I could around my schedule in Radford. So basically, I had two full-time jobs, but I wouldn't have traded that in for the world. I loved doing that. I only left there because I moved and took another job in Tennessee. Otherwise, I probably would have offered to do the same thing again <laughs> this year if they hadn't found someone to do it full-time. I do want to stay in the collegiate setting, I believe, but eventually I would like to be at a Power 5 school. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot, actually. I also used to do contract work. Yes, yes, you did. That's a whole. No, we didn't actually get too many people talking about contract oh, work. Interesting. Which I feel like is kind of more foundational now. I feel like before it was like you would do your undergrad, get certified, yeah. and then do your GA ship, and then get your two years of experience, and then go off into the real world. Whereas now, like you get a master's and. The, the infrastructure hasn't really caught up where there's like enough fellowships or residencies or like post-professional opportunities to kind of like be, still be with a mentor. So I feel like it's kind of like, okay, like get a part-time job yeah. or um, you don't have enough experience to get a full-time job. So take this like crappy internship that, yeah. you know, um, or just do contract work because that's all you can find. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's kind of been that like tough transition into the, you know, the master's programs is, you know, yes, better for the profession and, you know, no, you know, no one can take that away, but it also has made it hard on, you know, I like the route I took, you know, being a grad assistant, right? Like I got my master's paid for, that was pretty dope. Can't complain about that. And, um, you know, I got some working experience and a nice supportive way like i got i was pretty independent but i also still had like you know the full-time staff was really great about you know being there and helping us out with whatever we needed and help giving us guidance um obviously that's not the reality of all ga ships either there's a lot of other ga ships that are out there that it was kind of just like here you go you're thrown to the wolves and <laughs> you know we were very lucky that you know, if we had class, the full times would cover our practice or, you know, whatever we had during that class time. They told us, like, we were paying you to go to school, so you were expected to be in your class, mm -hmm. right? And some GA ships weren't like that. They were just kind of like, well, you need to figure it out. Your team's practicing. Right. And you're the athletic trainer. That is the one thing that it was really hard for me to find a job. Yes, I remember that. After um, I got my master's. But... I think that is already changing in, it is. In, in the past few years. And I would even say, like, talking about the internships, like some of these internships and fellowships, the pay has gotten better from when they first came out. Mm -hmm. Because basically when they first came out, it was basically a glorified, well, not even glorified, it was just a GA ship without the benefit without of the get, yeah, without getting your master's paid for. So you don't even get a degree. Yeah, you just got the terrible stipend that you would get as a GA. Right. But now I've seen some of these positions and I'm like, okay, like that's still not as much as you should probably be getting paid, but it's like, mm -hmm. at least it's showing progress. Mm -hmm. Um, I found that working two part-time jobs was, was the best like stability wise. Yeah. And it was something attainable mm -hmm. and, um, something that kind of gave me a full time, um, pay yeah with also getting the experience and so and and in two different settings yeah so that was beneficial for me until i was able to get enough experience to actually like get a real big girl job <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but you know everyone's gonna find different i know um there are actually some athletic trainers now who are able to find full-time jobs after their masters yeah which i feel like other than high school i didn't really feel like I knew too many people right out of my master's program who were yes, really yeah. getting full-time jobs, but yeah, no, definitely. 
high school is not just reserved for the newly certified. You know? No, no. And it, it, you know, and it doesn't have to be either. You know, there's definitely right. more seasoned ATs that are passionate about the high school setting, which the high school setting does need that too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so with journeys and athletic training, it would be just dismissive and honestly just disrespectful if we didn't talk about the mentors that helped us get yes, through Yes, Absolutely. Huge shout out to all my mentors and preceptors, starting from observation hours, starting way back in high school. They gave me the glimpse of what this job is really like and really helped solidify what this is, that this is what I want to do. This also includes Randy, who I did my observation hours with at SDSU before applying for the program there. Hi, Randy. Hello. (laughs) In regards to my journey, mine was a bit weird because of COVID. Online learning wasn't ideal, but it's what we had to do. I also didn't start in-person clinicals until the last three weeks of my first year in the program. Oh, that's tough. More time in clinicals would have been nice, but that was a little bit out of my control. So then to piggyback on this, I yes. actually asked Ellie um, if she felt like it, she had any setbacks like because of COVID. And she said, a little bit with the hands-on. Part of it, especially in the beginning, but because of COVID, we dove deeper into the conceptual ideas. And my two clinical sites my senior year were amazing in providing a lot of hands-on experience. Nice. That's awesome. Which if you think about like PA school... Some of them are structured where the first two years are literally just lecture and then the third year is their immersive yes. clinical. Yep. So they might not even get clinical until their third year. Yep. And so like it's not necessarily a bad um, uh, structure yeah. if you do it right. Yes. And the only reason why I also can like kind of jump on that train is because, and I've talked about this before, I had it um, one of my semesters, half of my rotation, because I did a dual rotation, mm-hmm. one of them was completely observation. So, and everyone was like, oh, what, like, how are you just doing observation? How are you, like, you're not learning anything, like, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, actually, I think that we spend too much time as a student trying to figure out ourselves. Yeah. And trying to figure out what to say next and figure out what the evaluation should look like. And we completely forget that we have seasoned athletic trainers Mm -hmm. over here who have already figured it out. Yeah. That we can watch and we can figure out, Mm -hmm. we can learn from them and figure out what we like and what we don't like. And then I can take that and do my own thing. Yep, that's true. And that was so important to me, and I think that's where I got a lot of my evaluation skills and a lot of my manual therapy and all that was from them. Nice. Honestly, that was probably a semester I learned, like, the most, I want to say. Yeah. Like, hands-on was really important. It does give you the chance to sit back and, you know, watch and, like, really try and analyze what they do and try to fully understand it without the pressure of, like, also adding you have to do it. It's like the, it's like reading the instruction manual yeah. before actually putting a bookshelf together. Instead of reading the manual while you're putting the bookshelf <laughs> and together. And like you don't, no one wants to read the manual first, <laughs> but it's, it does save a lot yeah, of time. Yeah, it does. 100%. You want to read the next one on mentors? Yes, this one's by Sarah Y. I had the privilege of having two preceptors that really pushed me to be my best. My collegiate mentor let me take the reins with evals and making the athletic training room, quote-unquote, my own. She constantly tested me, and this helped me find my weak spots and polish up my skills. My AT of my high school rotation did the same. All evals were done by me, and I developed the plan of care. These two mentors helped me blossom into the AT I've become. Nikki and Wayne, I could not have become the AT I am now without you. See more shoutouts. Yeah. Um... I like doing this with my students. I'll be like, all right, you're the certified today. Oh, man, dude, that's what I do during games with my mm-hmm. students right mm-hmm. now. And I, and I just found out, you know, one of my students, uh, she completed like the uppers portion of her classes. So mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. she can do upper body and lower body evals. Ooh. So that day she told me, I was like, all right, cool. So you got anything that happens <laughs> on the court today. And that look, that look on their face when you tell them that is just, it's pretty priceless because mm-hmm. it's the, Oh, yeah, I'm following you. Um, I definitely had a preceptor who I, I fought with because they would tell me the treatment plan without me weighing in on or allowing me to critically think uh-huh. about. And I was like, listen, like, I know you already have this figured out. Yeah. 
and I think it's important to like for you to guide me on that but like give me a second to to come up with it yeah and then we can talk about why my way works or doesn't yeah and then we can still do your way like that's fine but like let me learn in that process yeah i'm trying to be better about that about my students uh like a you know when they say what their treatment plan is i still Mm want to take components of it into Mm -hmm. whatever i was going to do so then just Mm -hmm. doesn't feel like oh you're just doing what i want you to do Mm -hmm. um but sometimes what I've noticed too is like, again, it's not the student's fault. You know, they got a lot, a lot to think about. And sometimes, again, you just don't know what you don't know. You know, like I'll be trying to like lead them a certain direction, and what they said is fine. You know, everything like their treatment plan works out great. But I wanted to add one more little thing that I feel like will make it even better. And then I'll be like, oh yeah, well let's maybe do like the cups before we do that one that they suggest. And they're like. Oh, we could do cups for them. Like, yeah. yeah, we could throw in a little manual therapy, and that's all right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, but no, I that's what I'm trying to be better about. Like, l- one, making the students think through the plan of care, even if it's them not going to do it. Right, like if it's the next day, and I know they're they're not going to be there for the student athlete, and it's it's going to be me. I still want to know. Okay, so you're going to see them tomorrow. What are you going to do? You know, make them come up with it, or like right there when they're they have the student athlete. I try to, if they give me their plan of care, you know, if they don't hit everything I want, I still want to take what they're putting out there because, you know, I want them to feel that reward of, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm getting better and what I'm doing is helping. Right. So this next one about mentors is by Stephanie B. She said, my OG mentor was the person who got me involved in athletic training, my high school AT. She signed paperwork my senior year for me to use a free period to have class with her. She brought in her principles of athletic training textbook and started teaching me. We still talk a couple times a year. The mentor I speak to most was my first boss. I talk with her every day about life and athletic training. I tell her she ruined me because I'm never going to have a leader in the boss role as incredible as her. (laughs) Everything we did was backed up by research. It taught me early on how to defend my work and best support my patients. When she left her position, I knew I had to leave too. I had a rude awakening to see some departments not reach for the same level of care as how my mentor taught me to do. Now I focus on trying to create that same level of care with limited support while empowering other ATs in the university to reach out for more with me. Yeah. It's a good role. That is a good role. A good that. mentor who passes that on. Yep. Um. So she actually also continued to talk about some changes that she would make. Okay. And she said, I wish I would have taken school more seriously by learning to love the boring courses like gen med and pharmacy. <laughs> I also tell myself to appreciate my first job more. It was incredible and I'd go back and do it again if I could. Nice. Would you change anything? Honestly, no. I think my time in the program was great. That's good. Like I look back and those are some of the most fun years. Again, my cohort, we were family and, you know, literally we spent every day together mm-hmm. in some capacity even summer mm-hmm. like for the most part like when we didn't really have class and we were working camps we were still together we would still hang out in the clinic or like in the um athletic training lab like we were constantly around each other and um that was the, some of the most fun times mm-hmm. ever and and we you know how the fullerton program was structured was we really bought into family and you know, we dove into that and that's what it was. And it was, it was a blast. I learned so much and it really shaped me who, as the clinician I am today. I think, I think maybe the one thing is when I got certified, when I was a grad assistant, I wish I was more focused on remembering that I'm still just a new certified (laughs) Uh instead of trying to be like, Oh, I'm certified now. I need to know everything. This is my team. I need to, you know, set my tone. Like, I'm trying to be the full-time, even though I'm not full-time. Right. I wish I would have just stepped back a little bit more, maybe asked a few more questions. That's a good one. Yeah. I, looking back... Actually, I, I... This is not from looking back, but this is from, I guess, what I know now. Mm-hmm. Because now that I'm teaching courses, like, I'm seeing that the... The students who go back to school and the students who are older and maybe doing this for a second time are the ones who 
have it all figured out. Yeah. Like they do their assignments on time. They don't procrastinate. They get things done. They get the higher highest scores on tests. They study better. I feel like um, I just in general do things very young. Like yeah. I graduated early and, and I don't know. I, I just think that we're in a rush to do things sometimes. Yeah. But I think maturity goes a long way. Yeah. And I didn't realize that until kind of seeing the difference in between my students who are straight out of high school yeah. and my students who are coming back to school. So with that, I think um, with what Stephanie B was saying about um, like loving the boring courses like gen med and pharmacy, yeah. like <laughs> I think that we only have so much of a capacity at certain points, but I think, um, and I, someone else submitted this. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they said that they are, what they're working on is kind of going back and looking at the things that they have kind of forgotten. Yeah. Because, you know, you don't have the capacity to remember like every single detail of, and especially the things that you don't use, like oh, yeah. use it or lose it. Oh yeah. It's, it's always like those like obscure conditions that you learn in school that you when you first get certified, you're like on top of, mm -hmm, but like, mm -hmm. again, it's one of those things where like, are you maybe, maybe you see it once in your career, right, right? But you still need to be able to know it and identify it. So Rebecca R said, I would have learned at a younger age to network and advocate for myself. Also would have learned better work-life balance. I think if I were to change anything, I would um because uh advocate for myself kind of yeah. reminded me um i would take the lesson from the refs and how coaches yell at the refs yeah, yeah. and how refs have to like not respond yeah and do that as an at like yeah that's true take that approach and they're your coworker. you are not their boss they are not your boss yeah you are on the same playing field they can't talk to you like that you can't talk to them like that you guys are working towards the same goal. Yeah. That's kind of like the mindset I wish I kind of had. Yeah, no, I hear that. Uh, the work-life balance thing. That, I, I hear that. I didn't learn that <laughs> when, I was, when I was a student. <laughs> you know, but also at that time, you know, I didn't have a reason for work-life balance. No, but as soon as the coaches know that, then... Exactly. They exactly. expect you to never have never a reason like, yeah yeah for exactly work -life balance and then lastly some advice from nicolette and mvp, MVP nicolette <laughs> if you know your anatomy you will know everything advice for students in programs or undergrad yeah that's 100 percent true that's what i say mm -hmm. if you know your anatomy you that's literally most things of what we do involve anatomy you know what that's what surprises me like sometimes i get students who like their programs don't really set them up with like that grade of anatomy and I'm like, you are going to do some self-study because yes, you need your, pro to know that. your program didn't prepare you for like yeah. for your critical thinking and problem solving skills yep. and for the puzzle pieces you need to do your proper evaluation, not only evaluation, but like rehab, A rehab, like tape, treatment, um, a, a big thing, therapy, big thing, evaluation, um, not just you like need, knowing where things are, but how they interact. And how they pull, muscles only pull, they yep. don't push. Yeah. So think about where they attach. That's how they move. Yeah. It's so important. Oh, 100%. And you know what? I think, you know, this could be getting on a soapbox. I don't think like schools like undergrad and going into grad really do a super great job on anatomy as well because it's still... Like it's so compartmentalized and granted anatomy is really hard to teach to begin with because there's so much going on. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, fascia is not really talked about. But like when you we talked about fascia in mine. Really? Well, I also had upper anatomy and lower anatomy and spine anatomy. Yeah. So like when you become certified and you start going to these continuing education courses and like you start diving deeper into like some of the literature on some of the stuff, the big component is fascia and how important it actually is for um just one human health and just how your um muscles efficiently work and how they're supported and how that can really manifest in injury or um in performance so you know that was big shout out to anatomy trains 
If you haven't got, if you haven't read that book, you must. It's a must read. Um, and I thought it really did a good job of just giving. And there's a lot of fascia books out there. That's just the one that I definitely read, and it's a popular one. Um, mm-hmm. But that definitely highlights just there's a whole textbook just on fascia, right? And I just feel like you don't really talk about it when you're a student, and then you get out into the into the real world. And like and you're trying to figure these things out. And you're trying to figure these things out while where are these other clinicians just feel like they're just miles ahead of you just because they just know that. Right. So anyway, we have one more topic and it is what are you looking forward to next? This is like a question box that we put up on our Instagram. Um we are going to put I condense them down to like what one, two, three, four, five, six, like less than ten bullet points I tried to to try to get the generic like goals that our athletic trainer followers have kind of like set for what they're going to be continuing to do um we're going to put those in our facebook group so if you want to see what other athletic trainers are looking forward to next if you want to comment on this episode if you just want to connect with other athletic trainers make sure you head to facebook.com slash group slash at corner podcast just answer the one question to get in and it will automatically approve you um And then if you want to submit your story for a future episode, or if this actually made you think of a story, you can email us at atcornards at gmail.com, or you can head over to our Instagram where we're pretty active on posting story prompts every other week on our Instagram stories. And then again, every other episode is education or stories. This one was a story episode. Next week, we are going back to our education. And some education episodes are CEUs. So just look for CEU labeled courses. Mm -hmm. Um, We do have our latest CEU free. The three after that are a dollar. And then any after that are just regularly priced from Precision AT, our partner. So super thanks to them. Big thanks. Big, big, big thanks. And happy National Athletic Training Month. We are so happy you guys are here. Um, Welcome on your journey wherever you are. If you're a student... If you are an athletic training student, if you're in a program, if you are newly certified, if you're seasoned, if you did your internship route and are telling your tale. Yeah. Or if you're from the bachelor days. (laughs) We love to hear from you. And there is an AT for that. There is. (laughs) I think that is all I have. Yep. That was perfect. Thank you for helping us showcase athletic training behind the tape. Bye. Bye.